les mots pour exprimer mes larmes, je n'ai pas de larmes pour mon chagrin. Je n'ai plus ni espoir ni force pour prendre les armes, je n'ai plus qu'amertume et tristesse par les mains. Je ne vois plus que le sang rouge versé par la haine, je ne sens plus que l'odeur des corps décomposés. Je ne marche plus autrement qu'avec cette pénible peine, je n'en peux plus d'assister aux menaces de mon cœur. Ne me demandez pas de justifier mon devoir, ce n'est rien d'autre qu'un humain scénario, dans lequel est mise en scène à s'y méprendre une épouvante vision de ce monde sur nous. S'il faut croire qu'il peut encore exister un avenir, cette terre souillée par la main des hommes. J'ose prier que les âmes qui s'en viennent à périr, aussi tourmentées soient elles mis par eux. En ces jours interminables de deuil, je suis à genoux, criant les mots et les phrases aussi forts qu'en silence. Qu'avons-nous à gagner dans ce monde de feu, rythmé par la détresse et la terreur obscure Ne me demandez pas de justifier mon enfant. Une entreprise humaine qui multiplie les sacrifices, au prix de millions de cœurs et d'âmes innocentes, et d'un magnifique bien que fait sa nature. Heureusement, Madame Dorino, vous êtes là, pas uniquement pour. 
This is a political domain which decides who can use force against another state. Then you have the separate domain here which talks about the those people who are affected by armed conflict and who should be protected because they're vulnerable within the context of an armed conflict. So here we're talking about the four Geneva Conventions, the two additional protocols, uh, and about 30 treaties that govern means and methods of warfare. Uh, and this body of law uh, really does not worry about the politics. It says it takes that if there is a, a, a factual con conflict, uh, on the ground, if there's a conflict that's taking place, uh, then then these provisions will apply in order to protect vulnerable populations, being uh, the wounded, the sick, the shipwrecked, the civilians who are trapped in conflict, those who are detained uh, as civilians or as prisoners of war or as other detainees. These are all vulnerable populations. Um, so it's very important that these be kept separate. But in the cyber domain, both of these can be engaged with one keystroke. You can imagine a single, it's, it's, it's maybe in the science fiction realm today, but you can imagine a single keystroke uh, which leads to a catastrophic loss at a defense building, say. Say somebody that decided to blow up all the radiators at National Defense Headquarters uh, in Ottawa uh, from another country. Uh, that would be considered uh, an, armed, an armed attack from the perspective of the United Nations Charter. But would also engage at the same time the protection that's required and must be given to the civilian population and to those who are otherwise affected uh, and vulnerable in the armed conflict. So I'm going to be talking to you, and I think most of the conference is going to be revolving around these issues here, but sometimes there will be reference to, to this one. It's important to bear in mind that there are two separate analyses, how you get into the conflict, the law of war, and then the law in war, if you want to put it that way. So now looking at the law in war, um, let me make sure I don't go over my time. This one. Yeah, okay, perfect. I didn't even look at my watch because I'm too excited. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the whole spectrum from peace to conflict here, this is a very non scientific, for scientists here, it's a very non scientific graph. Um, here, the, if we're here today in, in Montreal, uh, we have national law that's applicable, we have international human rights law that's applicable. And then at this end of the spectrum, you have outright international armed conflict, which is two states fighting against each other uh, who have passed the threshold of harm, uh, the threshold of violence required in an international armed conflict, which is quite low. Um, this area here is, is where we first see the application. So the red here is the law of armed conflict. So again, the Geneva Conventions. In this case, we're talking about the one article, Article 3 from the Four Geneva Conventions, and if it's a point of audition, <coughs> Protocol 2. But a cyber event, a, event that takes place, we have to look at it as outsiders and, 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 and analyze it and, and say, okay, are we here? Are we here? Are we here? And then pick up the right body of law and know actually where to begin our analysis. Because to, to start talking about the laws of war here is going to be completely irrelevant. So as you cross this line here, it's going to be the key one when it comes to non-international conflict versus uh, disturbances, for example, that might be happening uh, in this zone here. And that's going to be a, a function of uh, two criteria, the intensity of the fighting and also the organization of the party. Uh, but again, in the cyber domain, what do you mean by a party to a non-conflict? Because when we think about a party to a non-conflict, we're normally thinking about a group of you know, a group of you know, men and women uh, dressed up with their, you know, armed to keep them ready for the fight. Not exactly uh, what you picture in the cyber domain, just somebody sitting behind a computer screen. Uh, so, uh, so how do you relate these concepts? So, talking first of all about the right side of that graph, the international and conflict. This is where we look at Common Article Two of the Fourteen Year Convention. It's called Common Article Two because it appears in all four of them. Um, and we have a definition of armed conflict, which is a resort to force, to armed force between two states. So what is a resort to armed force? And Picte talked about, uh, it, was, it was an academic, uh, you know, from the, from the 1950s when they were back when they were trying to define these terms, said it was a, it was a disagreement between states that led to the intervention of their armed forces. 
Um, so it's a fairly low threshold. In fact, we, we usually say when it comes to the normal kinetic warfare world, we'd say that the first shot fired uh, between states is going to be sufficient to, to trigger the, the laws of armed conflict because there you already have potentially victims who are caught up in the crossfire. You have um, detainees who will be taken, who have wounded, and so on, who should all be protected. Um, in the cyber world, what is armed force? And this is where we take, we're taking concepts from, uh, from kinetic warfare. We're taking the concepts of violence and damage and, and somehow bringing it into this domain of, of armed force. And um, a lot of the discussion, and Sean will get into it in much more detail, uh, but, but a lot of the discussion is really around this, this concept of, of, of what represents armed force working across that line. Then there's the more, even more difficult factual issue, which is one of attribution. There's attribution, first of all, did a state carry out the attack? Well, very difficult to know because there's so many layers of secrecy built into the way in which these attacks are, these uh, attacks or not attacks are carried out, the way cyber operations are carried out. Uh, you also have the issue of proxy warfare. So uh, here uh, we're talking about non-state armed groups, for example, that are, that are going to be carrying out uh, attacks in, in a traditional sense, uh, that, would be, that would be under the effective control or overall control of a state uh, against another state or against another armed group under a, a similar type of scenario. So you end up effectively having two states fighting each other. That's also governed by this, this uh, type of law. Now, non-international armed conflict, it's always more complicated. Because again, every, every bit of violence that happens in society is not an armed conflict. There are all kinds of violence that don't reach the threshold. Um, and so even without bringing the cyber domain into it, it's already a difficult analysis because you're looking at uh, these two criteria I just mentioned, organization of parties and intensity of the hostility. So we talk about organization. You know, again, imagine picture a armed group and we're trying to decide if they are party to an armed conflict and there isn't an even armed conflict. We would ask the question, is there command and control? Do they carry weapons? Um, do they have an ability to apply the laws of armed conflict within the group, which would be a representation of, of uh, the disciplinary system they have? Uh, these are all uh, difficult questions already. And to put them into the cyber domain, we have virtual organizations. And, we're just talking about anonymous, for example. But anonymous, if let's say, for example, and I'm not speaking from any knowledge of it, but if, if they are a group of people who are connected solely by cyber means, and they're, they're located all over uh, in various different countries from all over the world, uh, and meeting through their electronic means, uh, can, can these types of organizations represent a party to an armed conflict? So if we go back to the traditional criteria, discipline, sanctions, of application of laws of armed conflict, it's pretty hard to imagine how you'd enforce discipline amongst a group like that in order that they're able to do so. Uh, but if you look at the object and purpose of the law, then uh, is, that, is that something that you really want to get in the way of calling these people uh, announced it on group, as an example. But anonymous is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, intensity. You know, it, it's one thing if you have a pre-existing non-international conflict that's already going on, and then there are cyber means that are brought into the equation, you can easily equate those two armed conflicts. Uh, but if you're talking about cyber alone, again, looking at anonymous, you know, if, if they were to carry out a, uh, this is really getting into, right, into my discomfort on a botnet attack, uh, where you're using all different nodes from different, uh, different computers, you're, you're using different computers around the world, carry out attacks at a particular time uh, against a particular target, uh, is that going to be considered uh, intense enough to, to constitute uh, an armed conflict which is at the threshold of, of intensity? Very difficult to, uh, to do, and attribution remains a huge issue, even more so in non-international conflict, or at least equal to international. So, uh, the first thing we look at, so now we have an armed conflict. <coughs> this is going to be the assumption we work under from this point onward. It could be an international armed conflict, it could be a non-international armed conflict. If, we're, if we want to know which body 
of international law applies. What we can look to for, for international law, we look mostly to Additional Protocol 1, Articles 48 through 58 of Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions, and it tells us uh, it tells us about these notions of distinction and proportionality and what's an attack and, and so on. Um, if we're in the non-international armed conflict, we look to customary law because uh, we don't have that same written body of law with uh, minor exceptions in additional protocol too. So uh, there, we, uh, there we look to, to very similar concepts, really. Uh, and and so, so we can talk of these now uniformly in an armed conflict of military necessity, distinction, proportionality, precaution, what some call humanity, and limitations on means of means and methods of work. Uh, these limitations here, just to get that out of the way first, uh, are, are limitations against means and methods of warfare which cause superfluous injury or necessary suffering. So in other words, uh, think of you expanding bullets or poison, uh, you know, poison or chemical weapons. Uh, the, 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 types of, uh, the types of means and methods which are going beyond just defeating your adversary and then leading to unnecessary suffering. I won't be focusing on those. I'll be focusing on two, three, and four, distinction, proportionality, and precaution. So distinction, of course, we're talking about the core principle of the law of targeting, which is the principle that you can you can direct your military operations, you can direct your attacks against uh, military objectives, and you have to spare the civilian population and civilian objects. That, that goes without saying. Uh, then you have proportionality, which is, you know, it, now you have your military objective, you're focusing on your military objective, but, but now you, you have civilians who are caught up in the uh, And in that situation, uh, you have to then weigh out the, the military advantage of the attack with the, the potential for collateral damage to civilians. So that is the part for Tobit on our way. You have always the idea. Um, talking about uh, precautions, uh, that's, that's really building on number two. Uh, and it's looking at all the means that are taken, the constant care that's required to uh, ensure that the civilian population is left outside of, of military operations. We'll talk about those in a second. But when we talk about uh, kinetic attacks, we, these are already difficult concepts, but within the cyber domain, even more so, and, and uh, it will become quite evident here. I think I have. So, I'm going to speed through this. So, what is an attack? Uh, well, so bearing in mind, just talking about distinction, proportion, and precaution, these things only apply if you have an attack. An attack is defined right there in Additional Protocol 1. It talks about violence. It could be offensive, defensive, that doesn't matter, but it's, 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 it's a type of violence. The Talon Manual took that and, and put it in the cyber context and talked about. Um, injury or death to persons or damage or destruction to objects. All of that was entirely, you know, mostly agreed to or found in the calls for the, for the, the some, some of the uh, lack of cohesion work. But the question for us at ICRC, one of the big ones was, what is damage? Uh, does, does impairment of function equate to damage? Does shutting down a banking system amount to an attack? Uh, does Turning off the electricity by cyber means and not to attack, and so on. Just to give you a couple of examples <coughs> that I want to answer. Yeah, disrupting the, the power grid. If you were to drop a if you were to drop a bomb uh, on a power station and, and thereby take down the, the civilian electrical grid, or the pardon me, the, the electrical grid which belongs to both the civilian and the military, it would be a dual use object. Uh, <laughs> That would not only be considered an attack, but it's easy to imagine an attack there because it involves violence. It involves a bomb landing and, and, and uh, projection of uh, uh, an explosion and all the rest of it. But okay, what, what happens if you, if, you, if you draw back and say, okay, this is happening at a technical level, you're turning off a switch, and that's it. So is that enough for the attack? Um, you can draw parallels between the two, and, and again, Going back to the, the, the ICRC position on this, we would say that it still causes um, the, uh, an analogous amount of, uh, of harm. So, so going back to this notion of damage, uh, if, if the impairment of function 
looking at the object and purpose of international humanitarian law, but the, the, the whole notion is to try to protect the civilian population, not to look at technically exactly how they led to be put into a vulnerable sort of situation, if that makes sense. But the, the, the point being that there will be consequences of humanitarian nature, and this is where we'll come in with particular, a, a fairly predictable um, interpretation of these provisions, but there's also another side to the equation. Uh, blocking websites, blocking Facebook, uh, you can imagine this, this can be quite legitimate from the perspective of military objectives if in fact they're making a contribution to, uh, to the military endeavor. Um, those are difficult questions. So, station attack also, when you're looking at people, you're looking, uh, if you're launching an attack of a cyber nature, you want to look at what is the kinetic result from that, well, you have to, you have to ensure that you're pointing your, um, your attack towards fighting forces. But who are, <coughs> who are the fighting forces? Um, well, fighting forces, combatants in an international armed conflict are fighting forces. Um, fighters in a non-international armed conflict are fighting forces. But what about civilians who directly participate in hostilities? We know that they are also targetable. Uh, is somebody sitting at a computer screen going to be considered uh, considered a civilian director participating direct participate in hostilities? Uh, the whole discussion about direct participation hostilities is a, a extremely complex one. I won't get into the whole thing, but we could have a, another couple of hours just on that alone. Objects, we're talking about civilian objects versus military objectives. Um, and you can see that the, the rules are based around the concepts of, of function, that uh, the nature, location, purpose, or use are going to be key aspects. So we know that a pickup truck is a civilian object, but if you put a machine gun on a pickup truck, or soldiers inside the pickup truck, it becomes a military objective. How do you do the same analysis with computers? When we talk about distinction, uh, we also have to talk about dual use objects. Where imagine in warfare you have a bridge which is being used to transport tanks, yeah, but the bridge is also used to transport the civilian population. Is that an military objective? Well, the, the law on conflict is said, yes, it is, but you then have to take into account the next step, which is proportionality, and look at the consequences for the civilian population. Uh, the internet itself, is it a civilian object? Well, it would seem to be. They're all using it. Some of you are probably using it right now while I'm speaking. Uh, and <laughs> And that's, uh, you know, that's something we understand to be civilian. But the military also uses civilian infrastructure. And the government of the US, for the US government, for example, uses 98% of, of, uh, of their use of networks, you know, according to their own audit, is, is, is on the civilian infrastructure. So that means, of course, that it's a dual use object. And that also means that it could become a military objective. Uh, so you know, how do we look at that in, first of all, a way that's actually meaningful? Uh, and second of all, we wrap our heads around the fact that we're, everything's a military objective on the, on, on the networks that we're using. Um, but then the, the key principles are really the ones that come after of the proportionality and the precautions we have. So now at my time, I'll stop here. But I just wanted to mention, I already mentioned proportionality to you, I already mentioned precautions quickly. I just wanted to mention this one last article which is um, Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1. And it's the cornerstone of the whole thing because this, is, this comes back to states and their obligations when it comes to cyber. Uh, not just cyber, it applies to all sorts of weaponry, but that in the study, development, acquisition, adoption, etc. of a new weapon, um, or means of uh, method of warfare, they're under an obligation to determine whether its employment would in some circumstances be prohibited. So before employing the Stuxnet virus or the, what you, know, you pick your virus, before you send that thing at the enemy, you're gonna have to decide whether in fact uh, it could potentially violate the principles of the laws of war, the distinction of course not even caution uh, when it comes to attack. But again, bearing in mind that that only applies to attack, you know, in situations that fall below that threshold and for which the principles are not applicable. So for example, if you're using uh, cyber means in order to carry out propaganda. Well, that would be something falling short of an attack and therefore not 
but the Boeing, in fact, you couldn't have rented it from Boeing So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a topic which has a huge amount of depth to it, and I've given a very, very thin gloss just to begin. But I hope that gives you a little bit of a uh, starting point. I'm happy to uh, discuss further. I don't want to take any further time or if you guys want. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the university for bringing you here, and that's not premature, I'm sure, to congratulate Emmanuel and Karima on an excellent uh, event here. I have to say, I, I am massively impressed to see this many people in an academic building on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> this would never happen at my law school. You are, you are getting something right. Um, I am uh, I'm, I'm deeply honored, and I'm awfully impressed. Uh, so, I'd also like to thank Andrew for that really nice uh, introduction uh, to the subject. It's made my job a lot easier. And what I'll try to do then is to select a few of the subjects that he discussed with you and to go a little deeper uh, on a few of them. To do that, uh, to go to the next one, uh, I'll talk about this Tala manual. So, it was, it was raised in the introduction. Karima was nice enough to mention my, my role in the production of this manual. Uh, and Andrew was kind also to cite it a few times in his presentation. Uh, so it is a book that was published in 2012. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it was published with the support of a NATO organization that's located in Tallinn, Estonia. Well, when I was invited to participate in the project, I kind of looked up uh, Estonia real quick, because to be honest, I had never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, wow, it's former Soviet Republic. Uh, we were going to meet three, four times a year. Uh, and I thought, and it's a long way from Nebraska, where I'm from, and I thought, gosh, do I really want to go that far to a former Soviet republic that's probably all run down and ugly? And uh, I said, well, wait, though. This is a really important subject, uh, and, I, and I love international law, so okay, I'll do it. I get there, and Tallinn is gorgeous. I mean, if you've never been to Tallinn, Estonia, go out of your way to get there. It is fantastic. It's like a, an affordable version of Scandinavia. It, it really is. It, it is fantastic. So. I uh, have to give some props to, to the folks in Estonia for helping us put this together. So there were a group of us. There were 18 to 20, <coughs> 20 of us. Uh, I brought a cold from Nebraska, by the way. You're welcome. Um, and uh, there were 18 to 20 of us, all law of war, IHL specialists. And uh, the goal of the manual was to come up with some rules to see if we couldn't come up with not, a, not an academic treatise, but rather something that was more practical in nature, some rules that a military a cyber operator and maybe her, um, her legal advisor could actually look at when they were planning cyber operations. Uh, and so it is styled <coughs> as a manual and it's got these black letter rules. So we've got 95 rules that are all drawn from the two branches of the law of war. They are drawn from the use ad bellum that, that Andrew explained so clearly to you and the use in bellum or IHL as it's, it's mostly being called uh, these days. For something that counts as a rule, Every single member, that is all 18 or 20 of us, some, some members didn't survive the whole three-year process, and were reported off the island, I won't tell you who they were. Um, but at any rate, to be a rule, it had to be supported unanimously. Every single one of us had to agree with every single word in that rule. Now that's really difficult. If you've ever been in a room of lawyers, you know that getting them to agree to anything is almost impossible. And so that's why it took us three years uh, to produce this thing. Uh, but our disagreements, <coughs> that is, our, our side views and our, our thoughts on more detailed provisions appear in commentary. So each black letter rule is followed by, in some cases, a fairly lengthy commentary on that rule that explains how it might operate. And we've got, I think, which is also helpful, some cyber explanations. That is, some, some context that we add to it. We imagine an operation, a hypothetical, and we try to walk the reader through this thing uh, to give them a sense of how we think that rule would operate. Uh, the central thesis, if you want the, what is this manual all about? What is its most important conclusion? Uh, it's listed there for you at the bottom. It is that while this stuff is novel, and while, as Andrew pointed out earlier, the Geneva Conventions drafters, 1949, never heard of cyber, right? Uh, the United Nations Charter drafters, 1945, in their wildest dreams, could never imagine that states could use cyber to initiate armed conflict with one another. That notwithstanding, that's this stuff. This law all still applies it to cyberspace. Now, that may not sound earth-shattering to you or significant, but honestly, at the very beginning, at the very earliest efforts that international lawyers made to apply international law to cyberspace, there was a camp of lawyers that was a view that said, hey, look, this is just too different. 
Cyberspace is ethereal, it's metaphysical, it's virtual, it doesn't exist. How in the world are you ever going to apply international law to that context? Now, as that debate matured, fewer and fewer adherents to that viewpoint were made. And I think it's primarily because we began, we began to better, and by we I mean lawyers, began to better understand what cyberspace is all about and how it works. If you dig down and actually study it, it's actually not that virtual at all. It's actually not that ethereal at all. It's actually, actually quite real. It's made up of cables, it's made up of computers, it's made up of satellites and transmissions, all things that fall under the traditional jurisdictions and the traditional reach of international legal systems. So, the most important conclusion, the thing to remember about the Pollen Manual, is it is an effort based on this single conclusion that yes, all of the existing international law is still relevant, it still applies, now it requires some adjustments, as Andrew indicated, I think some of the examples are excellent. There are some difficult questions about how the law operates, but the question as to whether the law operates or not is really an old one and it is extinguished. We have decided perfectly clearly, I think now, that international law does apply. Well, I think one of the important uh, points that Andrew raised with you earlier was a question of thresholds. If you know anything about international humanitarian law, you know that it is different from many bodies of law, especially from human rights law, in that it is not universally applicable. It is a regime that actually is quite obsessed with these thresholds. There are all sorts of thresholds. We did a beautiful job outlining them for you. But there are thresholds we as international lawyers have to investigate before we will apply the norms or the rules or the particular provisions of international humanitarian law. One that took us a bit of time to grapple with while we were working on the Talon Manual was the notion of groups and non-international armed conflict. As Andrew said, we distinguish in international law between riot or banditry on the one hand, to which national law applies, and on the other hand, situations of non-international armed conflict. Now classically, this is what kind of conflict? These are civil wars, right? It's conflicts that are contained within the boundaries of a single state that involve insurgents or rebels that have attacked the governing force. Um, we thought about this in the context of cyber, and we agreed very quickly that the existing law was sufficient, that there really is a two-part test in order to have a non-international armed conflict. You must have, on one hand, intensity. That is, the actions the actors are engaged in must rise to a level of certain violence. Secondly, the groups involved, especially the rebel or insurgent group, the non-governmental forces in a non-international armed conflict, must have a degree of organization. So I've listed on the left-hand side there for you our conclusion that there must be a minimum degree of organization. Just below that are the points that we were all able to agree upon. And the first was our guess that non-international armed <coughs> conflict in a purely cyber context is going to be exceptional. That it will be rare for, not for a group to be sufficiently organized, but we thought it would be pretty rare for one of these groups to be able to carry out sustained and prolonged and intense violent cyber activities, to use the internet consistently for, to produce sufficiently violent results that we would characterize it as an internet or a non-international armed conflict. Turning to the organizational criteria, and we took, I think, a pretty conservative view there as well. The majority said that the group does not have to meet physically. So to continue Andrew's hypothetical treatment of, say, the anonymous group. But my understanding is that they don't have a headquarters anywhere, right? Um, in fact, they pride themselves on not being traditionally organized and not having formal systems of discipline. Members come in, they come out. Uh, it's sort of an informal arrangement. But the fact that anonymous doesn't convene physically does not prevent them being sufficiently organized in order to take part in or to provoke a non-international armed conflict. Where the group began to splinter, however, was on what sorts of activities they had to do. Was mere collaboration enough? So there were a few potential viewpoints that I've listed for you uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner. Collaboration, the majority thought, was probably enough. If they are identifying targets, and although they're not working together, not side by side, as they attack this target, so long as they are coordinating with one another or sharing information, 
most of the group members thought that this was sufficient. A minority were a little more formalist or traditional in their application of the organization requirement to these groups. Most became hung up on this notion of discipline. Traditionally, organized armed groups that provoke non-international armed conflicts have had to have the capacity to discipline their members. And a number of cyber groups actually eschew that entirely, don't they? They wouldn't submit to some sort of old, formal, outdated form of organizing themselves. They're quite nebulous, they're cellular uh, in their organization, and so forth. Those traditionalists, the fact that these groups don't discipline themselves in an internal sense would preclude them from being an armed group sufficient to trigger the law of non-international armed conflict. Any questions about that one? Thoughts? I'm happy to be interrupted. I'll give and take more civil lecturing. No? Well, it is Friday. Um, <laughs> you're here. I'm, I'm still impressed. Uh, all right, the next issue that I'd like to drill down a bit deeper on is this notion of attack. It is a big one. This is my favorite area to investigate as, as a researcher. Uh, I'm also still, in, in, in my personal capacity, uh, a member of the United States Armed Forces. I'm currently assigned to a headquarters organization for the United States Cyber Command. I can tell you this is a very important issue for us. It is one that we struggle with uh, all the time uh, at, at, at our headquarters. But at any rate, uh, Andrew did a wonderful job outlining the law, and the part of the law that we focused on most closely was this term violence. So it actually appears in Additional Protocol 1, uh, these are the 1977 updates to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. And we said, well, what does violence mean in a cyber context? What does a cyber operation have to result in, or what does it have to manifest in order for us to say there is violence? And therefore, we would apply the rules of war, the international humanitarian law provisions that regulate attacks. That is, all of those principles and precautions that Andrew took you through, the principle of distinction, the principle of necessity, the principle of proportionality and humanity. Wonderful principles, but an international lawyer has to assure herself first that she's actually dealing with a situation of attack before she applies those principles to that, those principles to that operation. And so we said, well, what does violence mean? And in the rule, rule 30 there, I highlighted a few terms that were important to us. They were terms like injury, death, damage, and destruction. Those, uh, I'll add another, loss. You might ask, well, Professor Watts, where did you guys come up with that? Are you just making up law here? No, we actually drew those provisions from the protocols themselves. We looked into the rules and into the treaty provisions that announce the principle of distinction or announce the precautions that an attacker has to engage in before she launches an attack. And we said, well, these are important words that appear throughout. So that was sort of our guideline, or our, our the, the focus that we took on identifying situations of violence. Again, on the bottom left-hand side, I've identified a few areas of group consensus. We could all agree that cyber operations, even though they weren't necessarily kinetic, could be attacked. That is, because the, just because something hasn't exploded or because a projectile hasn't been launched doesn't prevent a cyber operation amounting to an attack. We were careful, and we all agreed on this point, to exclude so-called psychological operations, that is messaging that's used to intimidate or to influence enemy decision making. Uh, we were careful to exclude that from attack. We were also careful to exclude espionage. The effort to go out and collect information, to steal information from an adversary, is not an attack. Now, it could be carried out in the process of an attack. An attack could be launched in order to, to collect information. But the act itself, the act of simply taking information from a system, was generally not going to rise to the level of attack because, again, generally speaking, it does not produce injury, death, damage, or destruction at least in a proximate sense. Finally, we did have some agreement on the treatment of data. So what if rather than destroying uh, a cyber system, rather than even impeding its functionality, a, 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 a notion I'll get to in just a moment, all we do is enter that system and non-consensually extract data from that system. So we considered this question of data, and we could all agree that data loss the mere loss of data that doesn't produce 
death, injury, or destruction is not an attack and is therefore not governed by the rules of IHL applicable to it. That's about the end of our consensus, however. Then things began to break up. As we considered functionality, and I've listed the majority view for you at the top, there was a strong sense that if we launch an, a cyber operation that impedes the functioning of a cyber system, and to restore functionality requires replacement of hardware. You have to take a part of that system and replace it with a new piece of equipment that an attack has happened. There was, I think, almost, I think we almost had consensus on that. There were one or two that, for whom that was, that was not an attack, but we had a strong majority on that subject. Uh, secondly, uh, the majority began to splinter, however, when we considered functionality a little more deeply. If rather than require replacement of a, if rather than require replacement of a component or a piece of hardware, the operation simply required that the operating system be reinstalled. That is, we have to reinstall OS X10, or we have to reinstall whatever. I'm not a PC guy anymore, but whatever Windows you guys you guys are using now, we had to reinstall Windows on a machine. That split the group. A Less than half in each case regarded this, or took a different conclusion on this matter. We could not muster a majority either way. Uh, I should skip this, I, should, I skipped over an important example. Well, maybe it's not important, but an example worth bringing up. There was perfect consensus. We did get consensus on one fun functionality point. It was unanimously agreed that if the only thing we have to do to restore functioning is reboot the system, it is not an attack. That's simply an annoyance disruption and inconvenience. Annoyances, disruptions, and inconveniences were not attacks according to the viewpoint of the majority. And yes, the question, sir. Well, uh, <coughs> about the disruption of functionality, I mean, I'm disturbed by the idea that it's actually not considered the best thing. There even was a split. Because uh, disru disruption of functionality can have human consequences. Yes. And then in the context of IHL, actually, the principle of humanity is important. Yes. So to me, any disruption of functionality can be analogous to, let's say, bombing a specific part of a, of a power plant or something like that, and will result in a disruption of a functionality and have those human consequences. But that would stick to bombing a, an electric plant, and uh, that having a human consequences would be a violation of IHL. So why not the same in the cyber arena? There were very much members of the group that actually echoed your viewpoint, uh, and this was discussed in, in excruciating detail. One point that split the group was how closely the loss of life that results from the disruption to functioning of a system was related. If it was directly proximate, if for instance you were hooked up to a life support machine and an operation were to cease that life support machine functioning and you were to die immediately because of that, uh, there was broad, broad support for the notion that this was an attack because, again, we would manage to work our way back to those important words that are listed on the left. I would say the vast majority of the Tallinn group authors thought that that was sufficient to rise to the level of attack. That we used a cyber means or that we merely interrupted the functioning of a cyber system in order to effectuate death was, was not consequential to those members. You were, we're talking about a very small minority here. However, you can also envision situations. Let's return to the to this tower station example, right? Suppose that rather than um, rather than go directly after your life support machine, a force were to go after the power station that feeds the hospital, that doesn't have backup generators, and that feeds the room that that provides the power to your life support machine. Could that be regarded as an attack? The initial operation against the power station. This is where the group began to splinter significantly. For a vast majority of the members, there was not a proximate link. It was too indirect, the linkage between death and the attack. Well, I just, we're assuming it. We're trying to figure out if it's an attack. The operation in question. Now, there were very much members that would have sided exactly with what you were saying. They said, we don't care about proximity. It's humanity. It's about protecting life. And more particularly, we're talking about a civilian person, right? A person who is not lawfully targetable. Under, the, under IHL, um, but it simply was something that we could not get uh, consensus on, and therefore was not a rule in the Tallinn Manual, but is rather something you'll see expressed in the commentary. Um, what else am I doing? Oh, I have five. 
by a small group of members was to articulate exactly what you suggested. How certain must I be that the thing I'm attack attacking actually is a military objective? How certain must I be that the life support machine that I'm going after is his life support? Just you know, nothing personal. <laughs> <laughs> that the life support machine I'm going after actually is his life support machine. There were all sorts of standards thrown out there. So for some lawyers, an attacker must be certain beyond a reasonable doubt. Any criminal lawyers in here sound familiar? He must be certain beyond a reasonable doubt that I have the correct life support machine. For others, it was no, let's use a clear and convincing standard. You, there must be clear and convincing evidence that this is the correct machine and that he is a lawful target under, the, under IHL in order to be deliberately attacked. And for others, there was a preponderance standard. Well, it just has to be more likely than not, uh, a 50-50%. If I'm at 51% certain, I can launch the thing. Still for others, and I'll confess here, this is me, I don't know where they're getting this. I I've studied international law for a very long time. And I can't find the international law expressed consent of states to evidentiary standards in targeting. The best I think we can come up with today is a reasonable commander viewpoint. That what the law of war, what IHL requires today, is that a reasonable commander take reasonable steps in the circumstances ruling at the time, right? Not in retrospect, we don't get to do uh, you know, a, a nine month inquiry and, and use perfect intelligence in order to second guess her, her, her call on the battlefield. No, considering what she knew at the time when she ordered the attack, did she reasonably conclude that this was the life support machine of our target? And we were able, I was, I don't take personal credit, but we were able to keep out a rule that said a state, a commander must be 90% sure, 75% sure, 50% sure. There is no such rule. We only have commentary that says reasonable steps must be taken in all circumstances. Yes. Subjective or objective? Objective. Objective standard. And actually, this wasn't an innovation. Like, don't, don't give the Tom people credit for this. There, there's, there's case law that establishes this one from the ICTY. There are even post Nuremberg, uh, the Rengelic rule from the hostages case of the Nuremberg Control Council 10 cases established the same thing. And what's the accountability uh, criteria? Oh, boy, what a massive question on, on accountability. Um, we don't. We dodged that in Tom, actually. Uh, notions of international criminal law uh, were too um, murky uh, and we did not frankly have the time or the F or, or rather the funding to keep working and come up with anything in Tallinn. So you will not find much on accountability in a personal sense. You will find some state accountability. So we did delve into, if you know your public international law, you know the Articles of State Responsibility produced by the United Nations International Law Commission. We do have some commentary on that. And all the usual regimes of accountability for states that apply in general international law, we've concluded also apply in cyber. So if you're directing and controlling, if you are after the fact adopting an act, a state is responsible for this. Hugely important issue, by the way, in non-international armed conflict. Andrew mentioned situations where you have non-state actors who are actually what? They're not working for themselves, they're employed by a state. These are proxy wars, so this is state A hiring a non-state actor to do dirty cyber things against state B, uh, the law of state responsibility would generally look through that proxy and hold the state A responsible for it. Well, I have one minute. And considering who we've got in the room, I thought it important to make a few suggestions. If we could go to maybe the second to the last slide. Oops. Uh, Oops. Can we get a copy of the first slide? I guess we can. Why not? Yeah, why not? Sure. Uh, Freeman has all of them. I'd be, I'd be happy yeah. to uh, thank you. Uh, share those. Uh, one more, sorry, Andrew. Third, the last. Um, 
So to my eyes, most of you look like students. Uh, and I'm going to guess that maybe some of you might be interested in doing a little more research or a little more work in this area. These are just a few subjects where I think the Tom Emanuel's work is incomplete. Uh, it will be updated. Karima was also kind enough to mention that there's a 2.0 coming out. The major difference between 1.0 and 2.0 is that we will look beyond armed conflict. 1.0 will only tell you about cyber operations during war or armed conflict. In 2.0, we intend to look below the threshold of armed conflict. So even though the hostilities are not sufficiently intense and the parties aren't sufficiently organized to call it armed conflict, what international law applies? It turns out there's a lot. That's my next slide. But I think here we've got some pretty interesting issues. A lot of cyber has to do with economics and commercial activity. Uh, are economic target, targets in cyberspace valid? Uh, secondly, this was your question of burdens and standards of proof. Are there? I mean, am I wrong? Are there uh, international law burdens of proof or standards of proof that have to be met? I would love for someone to do a little more in-depth research there. Differential obligations. Is a technically sophisticated state subject to the same rules as an unsophisticated or developing state? Should the law of war, should IHL, recognize different obligations based on your capabilities. That is, if your duty is to do a little reasonable reconnaissance on your target, what does reasonable reconnaissance require? Does it require that you use every available system that the National Security Agency of the United States has? And if, on the other hand, Burundi were to engage in a cyber attack, would their obligations be different because of their capabilities? These are a few of those questions. Maybe we'll just end in a transition on some of the topics that you'll see in the forthcoming Tallinn 2.0. These are a few of the international law subjects we're working on. We are about, I'd say we're three quarters of the way down on the record. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for coming on Friday.